Before the presentation, I have a few quick announcements. Um, first, this webinar will be recorded, and anyone who registered for the webinar will receive a link to the recording via email shortly following the webinar. Um, second, if you're having any audio difficulties, uh, please send a private chat message to the host and we'll try to help. If you have any questions for Beth during the presentation, please enter them into the WebEx Q&A box, which is located at the lower right corner of the WebEx window. Beth will answer your questions during or at the end of the presentation. If you can't see the Q&A box, click on the blue Q&A icon in the upper right corner of the WebEx window, and the box should then appear in the lower right corner. And finally, when the webinar is over, you will be redirected to a survey. Please take a few minutes to fill that out and let us know how we're doing and share any ideas you might have for future webinars. And with that, I will introduce our speaker for today. Beth Ashmore is the Metadata Librarian for Serials and Electronic Resources at Stanford University Library. She received her MS in Library and Information Science from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And she's co-author of the book, The Librarian's Guide to Negotiation. And with that, I will now turn things over to Beth. Thank you so much, Esta, and thanks to the NASIG Continuing Education Committee uh, for giving me this opportunity um, to talk about this. I, this, is, this project has been really great for um, our electronic resource management at Sanford, um, and so I'm really excited to share it with other people. Um, okay, so we'll just go ahead and get started. Let me see if I can make my slide advance. There we go. How many times has this happened to you? Someone tweets or Facebooks a complaint about an e-resource not working correctly uh, to no one in particular. It's hard to count because you don't know when it's happening um, because they're not complaining to you. They're just kind of screaming into the wind or in this case into Twitter. Um, they didn't even have the sense to hashtag library problems, much less tweet at the library to fix the problem. Instead, they just express their frustrations to their Twitter followers, also known as a bunch of people who most likely won't be able to fix their problem. Um, this particular tweet here is not the actual tweet that sent my library on this little adventure, but it's a reenactment of an actual tweet uh, that managed to find its way to, to a library employee who then sent it on to me. Um, this occurred back in July of 2011, which seems like forever ago, um, when my library switched from one knowledge base and uh, link resolver vendor to a different knowledge base and link resolution vendor. And our implementation was a little bit bumpy, including a few days where to anyone who was off campus, the PMID search was stuck behind a username and password that no one had. Uh, the only problem was that no one on campus could tell that this was happening to people off campus. Uh, in short, this was a horrible implementation. Uh, even once we had this whole on-campus, off-campus issue sorted out, we knew that there were still likely problems with the new knowledge base and the new uh, link resolver. Um, and we knew we needed to address them, but as demonstrated by this tweet, our users were not great about letting us know when they were being left at loose ends. We needed to find a way um, to find out when the link resolver was not getting them where they needed to go, and in walked uh, interlibrary loan. Move to my next slide. In a 2007 presentation at the OCLC Iliad International Meeting, Karen Janke referred to interlibrary loan cancellations as the indicator species of the library, a species whose presence, absence, or relative well-being in a given environment is indicative of the health of its ecosystem as a whole. This really stuck with me. When I read this, I was like, this is exactly what we're talking about. ILL cancellations, specifically requests for materials that the library owns, indicate a potential failure within the library system. A user has found an item that they want, the library has that item, but they don't know it. Now, 
This ignorance is sometimes a willful ignorance. Uh, if you have an ILL department at your library that is good, that is as good as the ILL department at my library, there are some in your community who undoubtedly use them as a research assistant. assistant. They think to themselves, well, I don't know if the library has this item, but I know that ILL will tell me if they do, and they'll request it for me if they don't, so why should I bother looking it up in the first place? Don't get me wrong. These people exist. However, there are other users who request, who when they make a request for a locally held item, it is simply an indication that they were unable to find the item in local collections, which, as Janky says, is an indicator that something has gone wrong. And in the study that we conducted here at my library and that we continue to, to do uh, even today, um, in many cases that something that went wrong was our, link, our linking. So, Here's how ILL started to help us out. In an attempt to discover problems during our transition to the new link resolver, the ILL department began to notify myself um, about all ILL requests that were canceled because the item was available online. This notification consisted of um, being CC'd on the email that they would send to the user to notify them that their request had been canceled. And on the slide there, you can see kind of an anonymized uh, example of that, of one of those emails. There's really not a lot of information here. It's mostly just the citation, and then they include some instructions on um, how to get in touch with our Ask Us service, which is run by our research services department. We would then take the citation from the email and we would test it in, in three different access paths. Um, the first was testing at the um, journal or book title level via our library catalog. And then the second was to test at the book, article, or chapter title, um, whichever was you know the deepest we could go, via our library's discovery layer. And then the third was to test it at the book, article, or chapter title level via Google Scholar. Um, we also kept track of all of this information so that at the end of the school year, um, we, myself and my assistant, um, were able to look at the canceled requests in Iliad to see if we could discern any patterns in the kinds of linking problems that we discovered through the process. And sure enough, we did. Um, we, when we were starting to write this up, it was recommended to us that um, we try to classify these problems into groups to look for commonalities in the failures that we were seeing in our link resolution. And it was further recommended to us that we use um, a, a white paper from OCLC called Success Strategies for Electronic Content Discovery and Access. Um, a cross industry white paper and I'm going to give you the you I'll give you the URL and all the information because it's a really interesting white paper because it's it's actually directed at vendors it's it's OCLC talking to other vendors um, and so it's a really interesting perspective on what's going wrong um, <laughs> in terms of discovery and access and making things work well together. So the white paper identified three core problems with the current state of data quality. And um, all, of, all of these issues can prevent users from getting to the resources they need. Um, these three core problems are data are incomplete or inaccurate. And this includes bibliographic data, which is needed uh, for discovery, but it also includes holdings data, which is needed for the access part. Um, they found bibliographic metadata and holdings data are not synchronized. Uh, libraries and service providers have difficulty maintaining knowledge bases when they receive data for a single item or collection at different times. And then finally, libraries receive data in multiple formats. Libraries must spend time and resources reformatting and completing the data, which introduces the possibility of localized error. And it turns out that the systemic problems that we found really did kind of correlate in some interesting ways to these three core problems that were identified in the white paper. And I chosen a few examples of how the ILL data that we, that we collected on these, these canceled requests helped us to identify and report um, these, these, and sometimes even correct, in other cases, disappointingly not correct, um, these core problems. So I'm going to give you just a few examples here. In the first category of data inconsistencies between the source and the target, so the data are incomplete or inaccurate, um, in this first example, um, it has to do with dates. And dates, I think we can all agree, are kind of um, difficult because they can be com communicated in a lot of different ways. Um, NISO's open URL uh, quality metrics 
a working group which does which, which works with um, IOTA and all the different ways that you can define different metrics um, defines date in a number of ways and so like in this case um, in, in this example the date that was given in the source was in the form of a month and year so December 2007 um, and Unfortunately, when the source passed this information to our link resolver, they passed it just as 2007 instead of, and so we lost that, that extra bit of metadata, that extra, that, that month. Um, and when the link resolver got a hold of that 2007, it wanted to make that data more complete, so it threw in a month and a day. Unfortunately, though, it's the wrong month and day. It's January 1st, just kind of as a default. Um, so the link resolver would then pass that fuller date to the target and the target would not be able to find the article because there was no such article that existed in the January issue of the journal. Sometimes there wasn't even a January issue of the journal. Um, and so the user would be left with nothing. They would, they would get an error message. Um, this also occasionally led to articles being identified as being in our knowledge base when they were not because our access did not include the full year or vice versa. So for example, the requested article would have been published in the July issue, which was a part of our coverage, but the link resolver would make it look like the article had been published in January, which was not a part of our coverage, so the user wouldn't even be offered a link to the resource. Um, this was a case where we were able to identify that a single set of publisher supplied metadata in our discovery service was having trouble communicating back to that publisher's website via the link resolver. In another example that kind of fits into this is uh, correct made it metadata that is searched incorrectly. So the second issue in this category deal, dealt with inconsistencies between the data passed by the link resolver and the data uh, for the article in the target. In these cases, the target was an aggregated database that would conduct a search for the article in question based on the metadata passed by the link resolver. In many, if not most cases, the metadata was sufficient enough and correct enough for the, a successful search leading to the article that the user User wanted. However, in a number of cases identified by these canceled requests that we got from ILL, slight differences caused the search to fail. So for example, a journal that has a single level of enumeration, such as an issue number, in this example issue 2, gets passed to the link resolver as issue 2. So far so good. Then the link resolver passes this information to the target also as issue 2. So again, so far so good. But because the, date, the target database sees a single level of enumeration, it assumes that it's a volume number, and so it searches it as a volume number. And because there are no volumes in this particular journal, it doesn't find it. Um, volume two does not even exist. Um, we saw other errors like this with this target database um, that included things like where the, the source database passed an ISSN that was correct for the journal, but it wasn't the ISSN that the target database had for the journal. So maybe one was using the print ISSN and the other was using the electronic ISSN. And so it would do the search, but it wouldn't find that ISSN and so it would fail. Um, we also saw this with um, page numbers. So like it's uh, the source uh, database has a page number that's like S12 um, because it's in a supplement and then it gets passed to the target and the target just says the page number is 12. And so again, it would fail. Um, this second problem, uh, the first problem we were able to solve in this category, we were able to solve just by contacting the vendors involved. So the, our discovery service who is, who is getting the metadata from the publisher and they were, it seemed to, it seemed to be fairly easy for them to solve because it, it involved that single group of metadata from that one publisher. This second problem though, uh, was, seemed to be much more difficult. Uh, for the vendor to solve. And after a year of encountering these problems and seeing these requests for these articles that were available, we had to, we had to suspend the article level linking to these target databases for this vendor. Um, and instead we're using journal level links. Now this is a few more clicks for our users, but it seems to have prevented some dead ends and some unnecessary ILL requests. We 
are keeping an eye on this vendor, on this target database vendor, to see if they can improve the way they do those article level links and make them uh, more reliable. Now, in the, um, the OCLC white paper, it focuses on synchronizing holdings data and bibliographic data in discovery services managed by libraries. But there's other sources of bibliographic data that users encounter that require that same level of synchronization. Um, one example of such a resource is Google Scholar, which provides users with bibliographic data, a strong search algorithm, and when customized by a participating library, links to the library link resolver via Google's library links program. Um, the librarians at my library, we've uh, trained our users to look for that full text at Sanford link off to the right of the citations in Google Scholar because Google Scholar has become a popular tool for our faculty and students. Unfortunately, though, the canceled request notification process, through that process, we discovered that the full text at Sanford link uh, was not off to the right where it should have been, according to our knowledge base data, um, every time. And instead, occasionally, uh, like in this example here, it was tucked underneath that little more button uh, that appears underneath uh, the citation, which my users are not super likely to click on. It's, it's a little bit small. Um, now, our first, our first consideration when we would see stuff like this was that maybe this is a new title in our knowledge base and it simply just hasn't been communicated to Google Scholar yet. And that's why it's not showing up with the full text at Sanford link off to the right. Um, however, this particular example is a journal policy review that has been in our knowledge base. This access has been in our knowledge base since we started a knowledge base and since we started sharing our data with Google Scholar. So there doesn't appear to be any reason why this shouldn't show up. Um, and sure enough, when we click on that little more button, the full text at Sanford link is there underneath and we click on it and it takes us um, to our link resolver and sure enough, we have access to this article and have had access to it for some time. Um, this continues to be an ongoing problem and we've contacted our, our uh, knowledge base provider as well as Google Scholar to say, hey guys, this, this, this is not being synchronized um, properly and unfortunately it really hasn't been resolved. It's something that still occasionally comes up uh, every now and again, we'll find that that, that link is not uh, exactly where it should be. So the last uh, example, and I have to say, this one's probably the one that kind of gets my goat the most, um, is um, that uh, has to do with um, poor metadata formatting. So not only do libraries struggle with data in multiple formats, but discovery service vendors clearly do as well. And unfortunately, we end up being the recipients of the poor results when those formats are not harmonized and that metadata is not harmonized. This final systemic problem that we discovered from the, from the ILL notification process deals with a collection of metadata in our discovery service that had been harvested from an open access database. Um, the metadata appeared to be fairly complete in the discovery service, but when it would be passed to the link resolver, everything would go wrong. So here's an example um, of, a, of an article, Defoe's Protestant Whore. This was actually something that someone at my uh, library uh, had to put in an ILO request for. Um, and here's the citation in the discovery service for this article, and everything looks pretty good on the surface. Um, but when you start to dig a little bit deeper, things get weird. Um, so for example, the author's name is listed as added details. Hmm, that doesn't quite seem right. The source information is listed under abstract. Um, I, I listen, one of the podcasts that I really enjoy listening to is a podcast called How Did This Get Made? And it's all about like bad movies and, and crazy movies and stuff. And when I see metadata that's, that's kind of mapped in this way, I'm like, how did this get mapped? This metadata is all over the place. Um, it, it really, I, I, I want to start my own uh, library podcast on that. Um, this is a red flag that this, made, <laughs> this, met, this metadata is not going to map well to an open URL. And sure enough, when we click on our link resolver, um, the link resolver can't find this article because the only information that has been passed is the article title as both the article title and the source. Um, it, it's no good, it's no good. Now, if I click on the revised citation and I add in more information, something that 
I would pretty much say I can guarantee most of my users are not going to do. Uh, they're just not going to think about it. But if I do that, if I go in and add in all of that information that is back there in that record, just in the wrong spots, if I add it in, it works great. It shows me a link to JSTOR. Um, that link to JSTOR then links excellently back to that article. So I'm good. Um, but you might be thinking, well, wait a second, you said this citation was from an open access database, and there's a URL back there in that record. Um, why do you even need the link resolver? Why do you have to get the link resolver involved? Well, because that link back in the record leads to Project Muse. And my library does not have a subscription to this article via Project Muse. Uh, the article may have been open access at some point from Muse, um, but it isn't anymore. And uh, the, that Muse copy is not the appropriate copy for my users. Um, plus, this, you know, we're in a discovery service. This particular link is kind of buried uh, at the bottom of, of the full record. Um, a lot of my users will see a title, especially a title as riveting as Defoe's Protestant Whore, and they'll just click on the our little link resolver button and say, oh, can I find this? They never even make it into that detailed record to see that there's a URL, much less this URL that's not going to work for them anyway. Um, all of our vendors, our discovery, our content vendors, all of these different vendors, our open access databases, need to really think about those consistent data formats. Um, things like what KBART, uh, NISO's KBART recommends, you know, having really consistent data formats, because that will reap the biggest benefit in the transfer of this information from open access database to discovery layer to link resolver. I feel like this is the biggest problem we face in the discovery link resolver universe. Um, even though we wanted to include this OA database in our discovery service, this inability to link resolve the information made us have to hide it. We've had to remove it and, 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 we, and we continue to kind of look at it and we'll go back and we'll, we'll check it out and see how it's doing. But for the time being, it's not a part of our, our discovery layer because it simply leaves people at dead ends. Okay, so let's talk about workflow. NASIG, NASIG folks, everything I've learned about workflow, I've learned from NASIG, and so I have to talk about workflow. Um, after our first year of collecting this data from interlibrary loan canceled requests, we realized that this was super valuable information. It was putting us on to a lot of situations when our link resolver was failing. Um, and so we continue to use this data to identify both individual problems um, with, with particular titles that were easy to report to vendors or even correct on our own within the knowledge base. Um, but it was also putting us on to these bigger, ongoing, wider scale problems. Um, and it was really helping us improve our user experience. But the workflow of having the ILL department CC us on these emails um, every time a, a request was canceled was simply not sustainable. For starters, sometimes they forgot to email us. <laughs> sometimes they forgot to put our names in the email. Also, any information regarding where the citation was coming from, so for example, the database that the user was in when they clicked on the link resolver button, and then eventually the ILL request a copy button was not included in the email back to the user. So if there was a particular source out there that was passing consistently bad information to the link resolver, as in that last example, it was going, it wasn't going to be tracked down with this e email information. So it was obvious this could not be our permanent workflow. Enter Iliad. Um, our interlibrary loan department uses Iliad to manage interlibrary loan transactions and it contains all the data we could ask for. Um, what happened was they, the ILL department gave us access to the Iliad database, to myself and to um, my assistant, and it allows us to go into the database and we can run queries for canceled requests every day, and we follow in the footsteps of our users using the cited in data and see exactly what they see. On the occasions when the linking is really letting the user down and not able to get them where they're going, we reach out to the user um, with the information and, you know, we'll attach a PDF file or give them a direct link or something um, and, and let them know that we're working on the problem to kind of reassure them that we care and that we want them to get what they want. Now, 
I know that there are some, since the first time I did this um, presentation at NASIC, um, I've talked to a lot of people who, whose ILL departments do that as a matter of course. You know, if somebody requests something that's available electronically, they just send them a copy of the file. We've not taken that step to do it, but it is something that we regularly consider the cost benefit of, of doing that. Um, access to the ILLIAD database has also led us to looking at cancel requests for for things that are available in print and microfilm as well. Um, we keep track of all of this information and we color code it to, to, uh, to collect data at the end of the fiscal year um, in just in a regular spreadsheet. Um, and it really helps us to figure out um, if, if we're actually improving things and if users are being left at uh, fewer dead ends. In addition, this data has taken us to a lot of other places and given us a lot of other ideas about how we can improve our service. Um, one of the places that this data has taken us is to looking at library instruction and outreach. We have been able to identify from this data a few particular demographic groups, um, one of which is education grad students, um, who seem to have an itchy trigger finger when it comes to making ILL requests. Um, and, and it may be that they just need more materials, and that may be part of it. Um, it. It also could be that, you know, they're returning students. A lot of them are returning students. A lot of them are working teachers and principals, and they have families and jobs, and they are low on time. And they generally don't get as much library instruction as their undergraduate counterparts. So here's a market for our outreach where we could come in with just some really basic videos or just, you know, um, some cool tutorials and stuff that, that could, we could reach out to them directly and really improve their user experience and maybe save them some time, which is something that, you know, they will find particularly valuable. Um, it's also this, created this great working relationship between us and ILL, and it's really benefited both departments. They've given us all this great data, and we've assisted them in adding things like open URLs to their emails so, to assist users in locating materials um, online, as well as helping them to tailor the way our holdings are represented in WorldCat to ensure that they aren't getting loan requests for things that we're not able to loan. Just this week, we started seeing some canceled requests for things um, that were coming from our discovery service for that were coming from the database, um, the ACI Scholarly Blog Index. And we realized that these requests were being made and we don't have access to that particular um, resource, the ACI Scholarly Blog Index. But because these are scholarly blogs, most of these citations, the blog still exists out there and, and you can just find it for free. So um, seeing these canceled requests, I you know talked to our interlibrary loan people and I said, I'm gonna create um, a link that will show up in the link resolver menu that will uh, take the title of the blog entry and the author, which is, you know, the main man metadata that's coming from the blog index, and just do a Google search so that when they click on that link, it will do a Google search, Google search, I can't say Google search, Google search for the blog entry title and the author. And um, of the ones we tried, I think we tried about 20 of them, uh, 20 citations, uh, it was either the first or second entry that showed up in that Google search. And so it will hopefully save users time um, by being able to access those, those blog entries, but it's something that I would have never known was happening. And, um, and it's something that my ILL people wouldn't have known how to necessarily fix and, and, get in, and get in there. And so it's something that we were able to work together on and fix rather quickly when we noticed that people were requesting, uh, making ILL requests for these blog entries. It's also had us start thinking about interface redesign. Could it be that users just don't understand what they're looking at when they look at the link resolver menu? Of course it makes sense to me, but it's because it's mine. Um, can that menu be clearer? Uh, we also, um, immediately after the first year we did this, we, we looked at using uh, one click again so that users wouldn't even go to the link resolver menu if full text was available. They'd just go straight to the full text. Unfortunately, we share our uh, link resolver with, a, with our law library, 
And our law library has some resources in there like Westlaw and LexisNexis that are only available to law students and law professors and that sort of thing. And unfortunately, what would happen is a user, uh, you know, regular undergraduate user would click on uh, the link resolver button and it would try to take them to Westlaw and it would ask them for a username and password and the user's like, what? I don't know what's going on. And, and, uh, and so one click doesn't really work for us. Um, but it, it's one of those things where it gave us, I think it gave us kind of the courage to think about using one click again. And it really helped us to think about how we might redesign that interface to make it clear when full text is available and um, give, give users more instruction in that moment. Um, the process has also helped us to think about how we handle random open access articles that are available in, in institutional repositories, sorry, institutional repositories, or just a random, you know, OA article that's in an issue of a journal, um, and how we handle our print holdings. Um, we, we, shortly after we, the first year of doing this, we added a Google Scholar link that appears when no full text is found for a particular entry. This has been very good for, um, times when people are looking for ERIC documents or dissertations, um, as those are things that are more likely to be, to show up in, in a Google Scholar search as an OA item. We've also started considering putting our print periodicals into our knowledge base. We've never done that before, and I know a lot of libraries do that and have great success with it. We always were, you know, kind of of the opinion that, oh boy, that's so much work and your, per your print periodicals are changing all the time and how do you keep up with it? Um, but our print periodicals are shrinking, and, and so there's a lot fewer active print periodicals, and so it's really made us rethink you know, our users don't seem to be clicking on those library um, links um, to go and search the catalogs. Maybe if we could push that information up to the knowledge base level, um, they would have more success at finding that information. Um, and then finally, and I think this is the biggest thing, because I don't know about you guys, but when I was in library school, there was not a class about how to be an electronic resource librarian. Everything I know about my job, I have learned from NASIC or just through making a lot of mistakes. <laughs> and, um, and I have an amazing cataloging assistant who helps me, but she actually is only partly mine. She is divided between our, our copy cataloging, um, uh, you know, part of the department, and then she's part electronic resources. And she's just a, she's a recent uh, library school grad, and I struggle with figuring out the best, like, where to begin with training her on electronic resources. And this process of kind of backtracking and, and following in people's footsteps to figure out whether or not our link resolver is working has been amazing for teaching her the ins and outs of knowledge bases and link resolvers and how all these things work together and how to figure out when something breaks, where it is broken, and who to talk to to fix it and, and what might be the fix for it. Um, because she's able, when she's, when she's going through these things, she's able to see what link resolution looks like when it works correctly. Because of course some of these things work perfectly correctly and there's nothing wrong with it and the user just missed it, you know. Um, but then she's also able to compare that to times when the user gets left at a dead end and like get asked for a username and password or, you know. And, and so it's like she's able to walk in that, that, um, that user's footsteps and see how things went wrong and then try to see where they went wrong. And it's just been an amazing training tool. I can't, I can't say enough about it because I'm someone who struggles with uh, uh, training other people. And so it's been great to have this opportunity for us to share it and kind of um, see how, how much more information she gets just by looking at each of these canceled requests. Okay, so here are some references. Um, actually, my cataloging assistant and our former uh, interlibrary loan assistant wrote an article about this with all of the nitty gritty data, nitty -gritty data um, that came out in Cyril's review last year. Um, and so if you want to check that out, I of course highly recommend it. Um, and then I've also included here the, um, the link to the OCLC uh, white paper like, like I said, it's, it's a really interesting read because it is coming from a, it's kind of a vendor to vendor discussion, um, which I think is a really neat way of looking at, 
how we can improve. You know, we have so much discovery now. We have so much stuff, but it, it, it doesn't mean a lot if you can't get to the thing, if you can't get to the full text of things. And so it's a lot about that. Like, how do we make this really powerful discovery turn into really powerful access? And so it's a really neat read. And then finally, I'm including a link to Karen Janke's uh, uh, presentation, which I think is a really great way of kind of rethinking interlibrary loan um, and thinking about how that data tells us a lot about what our users are doing and how it's working. Um, so yeah, so now we're on to some questions, and I see that there's some questions. Um, Yes, our interlibrary loan, um, Eric just asked, does our interlibrary loan department um, review all interlibrary loan requests to check for electronic access? And yes, they do. And um, that is, sometimes they'll contact me like immediately if they see something weird and say, oh, you know, what are you, uh, you know, what's, what's going on with this? Like, and so they're great for identifying stuff even before um, it gets to be a canceled request. Um, and are we building our own KB or relying on a vendor's KB? We rely on a vendor's KB. So we rely on our vendor's KB, but um, we're constantly looking at other options. I saw a lot of, when I was at NASIC this past year, I saw a lot of great um, presentations from some wonderful Canadian librarians talking about cuffs and, and, um, and I know there's lots of great stuff going on with GoKB. And so we're always open to the best KB that's uh, available. Um, have we done any al uh, analysis of lending requests? We have not. But that is a great uh, area because I, my ILL person has identified a lot of weird linking things based off of how our holdings are represented in WorldCat. And so that's probably the next frontier is looking at the lending requests. Um, uh, numbers, how many requests for items owned come in each semester? Um, I don't actually have hard numbers with me because we're in, we're kind of in the middle of looking at this previous year. Um, I would say this, it, it is not, it is not as many as you would think. And, and a lot of them, a lot of the canceled requests, uh, we don't do anything with because sometimes they're requests for things that are either too new to interlibrary loan and stuff. And so we don't deal with as, as many of those, like we kind of put those off to the side. There may be something of interest there, um, but it's not our primary interest. Um, I imagine, you know, we are, my, I, I have, I didn't say anything about this at the beginning, but Stanford University, we're in Birmingham, Alabama, and we're a private school and we have about, we have a little over 5,000 uh, FTE. So we're not huge. And so I imagine scaling this up for a much larger institution um, to look at each of these individual requests could get crazy. Um, and that's kind of why I include at the end there that part about um, how great this is for um, training people, because it is something that you can farm out to um, to to folks that that are maybe like new to inter new to um, interlibrary loan or new to electronic resources um, because it, it's it's not something that you have to have like the highest level uh, you know information about it's like did you get to the full text okay well good you know and and so it's something that that uh, you might if if you've got a lot of canceled requests just because you have a huge population, um, you might have to come up with more ways to decide which ones you're going to look at if you're if you're not able if you don't have the manpower to analyze them all and to track them all back. I hope that answers that question. Okay. Let's see. Um. Have we noticed any changes in the number or type of requests since we started the project? Yes, this has been one of the fantastic things is um, we were getting we were getting a lot of um, requests that were being canceled because things were being were available um, free online like open access copies that we were that my ILL people were finding an open access copy through like Google Scholar, which was something that like we had kind of been like, oh, this is a great way to find open OA stuff or dissertations and Eric documents and good stuff like that. Um, and so we had kind of, you know, clued them into that. And so we, we started seeing that they were canceling these requests because things were available free online. And that was when we said, you know, we need to just get a Google Scholar search in there that will just, you know, person, 
clicks on the link, it does a search for the title and the author of the citation. And, you know, that way if there's an OA copy, they can find it on their own. And we saw a great reduction in the number of uh, requests that we had to cancel um, for things that were that had OA copies. And that's one of the things that I think is most frustrating for me is all those little OA copies. It's so hard to, you can't really get those into your knowledge base, you know, because you just don't know they're out there. Um, and so this project kind of led us to, to, to putting that Google Scholar link in there. And it's been great. It's been great. I've had, I've done an, I still do library, I still do a fair amount of library instruction. And I've had students, especially seniors that I work with that, that will say, oh yeah, I like that link. I like that Google Scholar link. And it's like, oh, that's my link. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been great. I mean, we still, I still have a fairly robust little, you know, I still usually have, I would say, probably two or three cancel requests. Uh, especially this time of year when things are really starting to heat up. I, I have at least two or three and sometimes a lot more canceled requests um, every morning to look at. Um, but we have a lot fewer of ones that are for things that are freely accessible, which is weird. <laughs> you would think those would be the harder to find, but they like the Google Scholar. Any other questions? All right, let's see. Has your ILL department considered turning these into documents? Yes. We do um, document delivery for uh, faculty and staff. We don't do it for students. And that's, um, this, is, this has been one of the most interesting things because I've found out a lot, like through doing this presentation at NASIG and through talking to people um, afterwards, I've found out a lot of um, uh, people that do that. And I, I would say right now, it, our not doing it has most to do with um, the fact that uh, it's kind of a philosophical thing with our reference um, services department, our research services department. Uh, they want the students to learn to find things. And so they're like, no, you need to, you know, you need to try to push them towards us to help them locate things. Um, and that's why the only time that I will send someone something is if something is super broken, you know, if, if it's something that I'm not going to be able to fix. And so they're legitimately at a dead end. I will intervene and say, listen, we've got something that's super broken. Here's the thing you're looking for. Sorry that you had to go through all this craziness. Um, uh, and so, so right now it's really the, the fact that we don't do it for students, uh, it's partly a manpower thing too, but, but I think mostly it's a philosophical thing. It's, it's, we're kind of teaching it, we're considering it a teaching moment. And um, that philosophy can change, I think. <laughs> um, oh, wait, here's another question. Did you notice any trends in the types of bibliographic metadata errors? For example, are problems mostly coming with specific type of information such as dates or volumes issues? Definitely with some targets, like that was the thing that I feel like is so interesting is that some, you know, the, the way some databases handle the request, if it's doing a dynamic search, like if it's conducting a search, then yes, that level, like, like having just small, just the tiniest of errors can throw off a search. It is ridiculous, as opposed to a target that wants like a DOI, those seem to be a lot less common. Like that's, those tend to be uh, pretty reliable and, and we don't, we don't see as much problems. So it's, it's definitely like when you read um, like stuff that comes, like reports that come from IOTA and KBART about like what makes for good open URLs, what makes for good linking, I feel like it's totally, it's, it's totally true. It's, it's 100, they're 100% 100 on, tr on track. And it's just a matter of getting vendors to understand that, that, that the way they're doing their linking is maybe not as effective. Um, and, um, and so that's, the, it makes me excited to see things like that OCLC white paper because it's one vendor talking to another vendor and it's like, well, you're not listening to me. You're not listening to this librarian that I don't like the way you're linking at the article level. So maybe you'll listen to another vendor and that will help you, uh, you know, 
understand a, a better way to do this linking because some people, you know, and I'm sure all of you probably have noticed this too. Some people have really reliable target linking and other people don't. <laughs> and uh, they could learn a thing or two from their, their fellow um, vendors. So, but yeah, it's, it's really helped us to identify who's got troubles and, and we try to, you know, report those troubles and say, this is really messing us up, but we don't always get a great response. Any other questions? Well, if you think of questions after, you know, I am 100% uh, let's see, we started seeing a number of requests coming in for theses and dissertations and they all had ProQuest LLC as the title, obviously a linking problem because we have access to how would we approach this. One of the things that we look at with those, and oftentimes I'll get my systems librarian involved in this, um, is the is that mapping. It's that mapping thing where it's like the way that the link resolver is communicating with the Iliad form, like the information that's being passed is not mapped correctly. And one of the things that we found is that oftentimes with, and, that, and this may uh, differ greatly if you're working with a different uh, system than Iliad, but with Iliad, um, the way that that information gets passed um, has a lot to do with um, what genre a thing is tagged as. And so if something's tagged as a book, it's going to pass that information in a different way than if it's tagged as an article. And so like, for example, we would see America History and Life would have a dissertation and it would look like an article. And like you said, ProQuest LLC would be like the journal title. And even though later in that same record, America History and Life would say dissertation. It would mark it. It would know that this was a dissertation. And so what we would have to do is make sure that America History and Life was passing that information and not losing that dissertation genre um, when it would pass that information so that then the link resolver knew that the genre was dissertation. And then when the user clicked that request a copy button in our in our link resolver, it would continue to pass that, dis that thing and it would know to drop that ProQuest LLC part and pick up the title and put the title as like a book title or in this case like a dissertation title. Um, it's it's definitely something like if you're starting, if you're seeing just that problem because I have seen that problem as well. Um, this is why having all that Iliad data is so great because you can see where did this come from? Did this come from American History and Life or did this come from, uh, you know, another uh, like Eric, you know, a database that I know has a lot of dissertations in it. Um, where did this come from? And so once you know where it's come from, you can can look at how did that information get passed to my link resolver? Did it contain everything that was needed? If not, then I need to go talk to that vendor and say, okay, you're not passing everything I need. Can you pass more information to my link resolver? But if it did pass everything, but then the link resolver didn't pass it on the rest of the way, then I talk to my link resolver. Or in this case, sometimes I get my systems librarian involved because he's got some serious skills with sometimes uh, hacking uh, these things and making sure that they, um, oh, somebody wants me to go back a slide. I'm sorry about that. Let me go back. Um, yeah. Um, let's see. What link resolver are we using? We are currently, we have just migrated to full text finder with EBSCO. Um, uh, and we have used in the past when, when this whole happened, we were moving from, um, uh, serial solutions to um, to EBSCO's link solver and um, and their A to Z list, which is now has we, which we've now migrated to Full Text Finder. Um, and the thing that I would say, and I've you know we've done we did a lot of demoing when we were when we made that switch from from Serial Solutions to EBSCO and everything. We looked at a lot of different things. And, I, you know, I would say, and I kind of tried to do this in the presentation, I didn't try to specify what we used, like what discovery we used or what link resolver we used, because I feel like these problems happen everywhere, you know, there, there's just so much data and there's so much possibility, like there's so many little places for problems. Um, and sometimes it's problem in the source, sometimes it's problem in the link resolver, sometimes it's problem in the target, and you just never know that, um, they all have their kind of their ups and downs. They all kind of, you know, or at least in my limited experience, um, 
each of them has things they do well and each of them has things that don't go so well. And sometimes it's it's nobody's fault, you know, sometimes it's it's starting out like that that example of the OA database, it's starting out with the information in all the wrong places. Well, a link resolver can't can't be held responsible for that. <laughs> you know, that information was just in some crazy places. And so of course it couldn't make heads or tails of it. So um so yeah, I don't really have um I don't really have necessarily a, a recommendation of one over another. Um yeah, it's only, you know, yeah, Maureen, you're exactly right. It is only as good as the metadata. Like, you know, that, and that's, again, that's what's so, what I love about that. I'm, I hope, I hope uh, that OCLC is going to see a spike in people downloading that white paper. Um, that's what I love about that white paper is because they're like, listen, guys, we can have all the discovery in the world, but if the user can't get back to your, your library's appropriate copy, it doesn't matter. It's no good, you know? Um, that linking has to be there. Otherwise, uh, and that metadata has to be there. Otherwise, uh, all you're doing is just frustrating people with things they can't grab. So, yeah. But I hope I hope you guys found this useful and let me know if you have questions. I'm more than happy or, or as I said, at, when I presented at NASIC, Lots of people came up to me with like cool stuff that they were doing that has really made me think about it, especially in the world of like knowledge bases. Um, you know, so if you're doing something awesome, I would love to hear about it. <laughs> if you've got some recommendations for me, love to hear it. <laughs> okay. I don't know if I should turn it back over to Esta. Oh, uh, are you planning a broader study of source or publisher metadata? Uh, possibly, maybe. <laughs> we're definitely thinking about it because we're just get. We feel like we're getting so much out of it. Um, that said, I feel like NISO is doing some great stuff on metadata, on publisher metadata, and and just like what makes for good metadata. That I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'd have anything new to say. Um, but it kind of depends. It kind of depends. It kind of depends on where the data takes us here. Like I said, we're finishing up looking at the data from last year, and and before you know it, this this fiscal year will be over, and so we'll have a new pile of metadata to look at and see if there's anything that that's worth sharing that we feel like would help would help people. So yeah, it's definite possibility. All right. I don't well, I'm not seeing any more questions, but if anyone has any further questions, um, please, as Beth indicated, send them to her. Um, thank you, Beth. This was wonderful. Um, I think we all learned a lot today, and we really appreciate you sharing your time with us. Um, and to everyone else, thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again at our next continuing education event. Have a great day.